let's get started. So today we're talking about a, a building outcome driven product. And this is actually a topic very dear uh, to uh, many of us because um, we are in an intersection of both the product um, business and engineering team. So we are actually the ones that connecting these two pieces together. So we wanna focus on a little bit about the, the theory, the best practices, and also talk a little bit about on how the Dragon Boat product can enable you to achieve that. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been in your shoes. I'm now the founder and CEO of a Dragon Boat. And the focus for us is to create this portfolio platform that's responsive, that connect the OKRs with the Agile. Prior to that, I've been doing product program management in multiple companies at different sizes. So you can see here, again, um, you know, the pain point that I experienced is really the main reason drive us to start this company and building this product. All right, oops. This is what we do, all of us. On one side, we have the business goals. So we have business metrics that happens all the time. It's moving, it's dynamic, lots of stakeholders. On the other end, we have the engineering team, a very rhythmic, you know, velocity, burn down, sprints. And how do we connect them together? That's what we do. Uh, it's not easy. So uh, we wanna talk about how we use agile product planning um, in a way that connects the two. And also more importantly, to talk about how we could look at the portfolio, uh, use the portfolio method to prioritize our multi-dimensional portfolio. I know a lot of you probably gonna ask, I only have one product. What do you mean we have a portfolio? And that's one of the interesting topics we'll discuss today. So this is something that many of us look at every day. And that's something we are ingrained about as a product and program scrum um, master, et cetera, roles, which is groom your backlog, right? We look at it all the time. And, you know, this is just a very fraction of our backlog. And that's quite a bit of work. It's very difficult for people outside our team, even for myself, to know which one is more important. Where should I focus on? So then, there's another way to say, okay, visualize your roadmap so you can see how the timeline goes and tags and dependency. Great, imagine you have 300 of those roles. It doesn't make sense anymore. So this really lead us to something that we really think about how businesses actually operate. The business that actually operate is from a bigger to smaller, right? So we look at our objectives, then from there we build our strategies. And then from strategy, we have our product ideas. And then from there, you know, see the little purple box? That's actually what the previous two slides about, right? So the, the epics and, and the tasks we're looking at. So what we realize is that, think about the, all the struggles that we're doing is we are taking a process for product and portfolio planning from a bottoms up. And that's the part where you look at your backlog, you groom your backlog, you're trying to prioritize your backlog in the colors and, and, and again charts. It doesn't really help with us because it is the opposite of a normal business workflow. So what we really should do and need to do is a top down. When I say top, it's not from executive tell you, you do A, B, C, D, right? The top down is really to think about where we need to get to, where's our desired outcome, and then from there, we can debate and line on strategies. And you know, obviously strategies on a big word. If we change it to the regular words, it'll be something like the initiatives we'll be focusing on. And that from there, you pull things into these buckets that would actually drive your, um, your, your prioritization or drive your alignment with the stakeholders because we, we kind of align on the big bucket items. So that would actually help us as, a, as an organization more aligned uh, and also for us the product program and um, scrum leads will have ability to say how these prioritization actually makes sense in the big picture perspective and also in this in the in the actual task and execution perspective so from here i'm going to pause for a second because i kind of just dumped a ton of stuff at once i want to hear from you 
does it make sense to abstract what what does it mean to you how do you feel about it sure one person gonna have something to say <laughs> well this is susan and i think it does make sense um you know we try to do a top down but not as far as what the desired outcome is so i'm waiting till the rest of the presentation <laughs> to to hear about that because right now we're in the mode of this is what the executives are saying this is how we're you know their time frame and that's one of the reasons why we chose dragon boat so that we can start talking capacity and making sure that we're making those decisions on when we can deliver at the right time um, right. so yeah so this this part makes sense um, the ideas and the epics again that roll up is what we you know liked about dragon boat so yeah i'm waiting to see what you've got coming up awesome so uh the so this really leads to a very very good uh, background susan thank you what what this one does lead to us is that when we have to prioritize like this right looking at the all the details it's actually very hard, difficult to prioritize and that really leads to the most common challenges we have is we have way more stuff for us to do then we actually have resources and um, not only just engineering resources sometimes even product manager resources to focus on therefore when we put this tool together is to say hey wait a minute before we try to prioritize the epics we actually just say how much we actually tie to the strategy so it's give us the ability to say we we'll prioritize at the higher level first and then we'll prioritize the lower level next And um, so with that example, I'm going to um, kind of go through a little bit of what, what do we mean by, by that. Um, so we will decide what we try to achieve, and then we have to decide how we will achieve them. Why is this them? It's because we never have just the one goals. We always have many goals. And not only we have many goals for the whole company or whole team, no, no, whole group, right? We could have one team could have multiple goals come to them, and then one goal could come to multiple teams. That's where the complexity happens. And I want to use that opportunity can kind of show a little bit of how this one actually looks like. Can you guys see my screen about a, a demo account? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So what what we're trying to do is quite often we are left with a list like this. We have a list like this, and it will say we want to work on certain time frame, and you try to prioritize in different ways. So we can prioritize based on, you know, resources and effort and scopes and and whatnot. That becomes very difficult to see. So what we wanted to do actually is coming to here to say, hey, let's decide on how we group them, right? And then one of the most logical way to group all the things you wanted to do is to group by OKRs, and you can call it a strategy, you can call it an initiative, and whatnot. And that's basically create a bucket for us to put things into it. So, one of the key things um, I'm going to touch upon here a little bit is that um, most of us, most of the companies that perform something called either quarterly planning or somewhat of a midterm planning, it's the cadence where we actually coming together to decide what are the things important for us as a company, what are the objectives, and how we are going to uh, go around to uh, set up this objective. And I think it's definitely a noble, and I think companies are getting better and better, especially when I talk to many of you, the OKR framework is being adopted more and more, and it, you know, focusing on the outcome less than, uh, more important than focusing on the activity. But uh, we also uh, come across quite a few sort of a common challenges in building OKR, um, and how that tied to agile execution. It feels that OKR is very high in the sky, where your, your roadmap execution is actually done on the earth, 
so that there's a big uh, feeling saying, hey, you know, great, we talk about, you know, we're gonna grow to 100 million ARRs, we're gonna increase our customer engagement, uh, you know, numbers by, you know, NPS to 85, and all these things are great to talk about. It doesn't really tie to how I write this particular ticket. And that's how we, and as well as our you know, Dragon Boat's platform, really carry you from point A to point B. In that you design on the OKR, which um, if we look at this example, increase existing customer engagement, improving conversion, and these type of OKRs are very, very common. If you talk to 10 companies, chances are probably half of them will have something along the lines of, um, you know, grow revenue, getting customers, reduce costs, uh, improve retention, and the platform stability. Almost, you know, 80% of the company will have OKRs like that, but doesn't really help us. The goal for us is to break that down. Just like we break down stories to be something less than a sprint, to be something maybe even half a sprint so that we can make, make it into manageable, measurable chunks so that we can iterate to a different uh, one next time. In, in this case, in the case of building OKR and a tie to Agile Roadmap, it's really having a mid-tier um, part of the, you can call it a strategy, initiative, or whatnot. That's the size of somewhat measurable and achievable within two months, three to a quarter. And then if you're a larger company, bigger company, maybe like up to half a year, but that's like the most you want to go. Because once you beyond that, when you see, when you start to have initiative last years, it feels like it never ending, right? We can't really say, are we there yet? So it's not outcome driven if we keep doing that and we don't know where we are. You can break that your OKR into achievable chunks. So that's called either strategy or key results or, or, or initiatives based on your company's terminology. That's the size of you know, three, four, four times or five times of your typical sprint size. Then you can kind of adjust and adapt in response to what the market says, what your execution will lead you to, and, uh, and how, um, how your competitor does, for example, what are new trends coming up? So I'm going to pause here for a second because I remember recently I was talking to one of the uh, customers and what, uh, when we look at the roadmap and look at some of the OKRs, by the way, uh, you know, we're here to help you. So if you say, hey, help us take a look at our roadmap. Are we thinking about the right, uh, along the right, um, right dimension? Are we, you know, some of the challenges I need to get my stakeholders, executives to buy in, because I don't think that's right. We are your resources. You can come in to talk to us so you can have another sort of neutral voice, at least uh, can um, provide some perspective. So by the way, this is separate. So um, when I was talking to one of our customers, about setting up OKR and I look at that OKR, I was like, whoa, this is like a three year, five year vision. And if you use that to um, manage your, um, your, your product and then prioritize, it's gonna be very difficult because by the time next planning quarter or, or, or half come around, you will have a lot of things to carry over. And then you have a lot of things to carry over that become a very difficult to say where we are, where we want to be. So I know I spent a lot of time on, on the okay, on the breaking down, but that's really important. Just like if you have an agile team, we need to train them, say, break down your tasks and stories to less than a sprint. That's a big part of the first agile transformation is to get people to be comfortable, to really think hard, how do I break it? This is also part of the responsive organization and responsive product in that not only you need to have outcome driven roadmap, have a vision and a strategy, you also need to make sure it's, it's broken down into the size, not too huge. It will be something the quarter or two months. So I'm going to pause here for a second. I want to hear uh, any questions, comments from anyone in the team. Hi, Becky, this is Patrick. Um, so can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes. So I'm aligned with this. And what popped up in my head is that, let's say an organization already has their programs or projects, but 
not necessarily having thought through their OKR strategy. Um, I don't know if you're going to cover this later on in the session, but yeah. how do we get that bucket into some sort of path for that team to start thinking bigger and wider so that um, we can use this tool and also be more um, be more mindful in flexing that muscle of thinking higher level. Right, excellent question. I think, um, so what we built is that even though we encourage the structure of a whole KR, but it, it also does not mandate. So you could very much to say, uh, let's go back to, let's go to here for a little bit. You see something coming, uh, someone was testing. Some, uh, if you can see something being uh, in the category that doesn't have an OKR, um, so it doesn't have objective. And over time, we can see, we try to see this list get smaller. In all our reporting, uh, you can see, for example, when we pull our reports, if we group, you can see OKR not defined. So these are the things, so if we also group, for example, by uh, roadmap, which is the product, the team, then you can see which team has more of a, and not, um, so they have, some of them have OKRs, and some of them don't. Actually, if I switch this around, I can look at by team, for example. So if I look at the area, and then I will look at the OKR. So you can see, okay, this team has some of the OKR didn't defined and they define the others. So this kind of um, visibility will help you to say, hey, we did well, we have most of the items, uh, you know, um, in, in, in under different goals and categories of, uh, uh, you know, categorize our work into, into goals and, and OKRs. Some of them are not here. So next time we can think about how should we categorize this? How should we categorize, you know, this is not a good example, but let's say it's something that where's this one, this one fit? Do we forget to include some of the key goals? Because what happens is this, right? Um, I wanna go back to a little bit top down or bottoms up. And a lot of people say, if you do a top down uh, product planning, does it mean you're not encouraged innovation and then the activity from the team, a lot of times they have good ideas. And I say, no, that's not the case because the good ideas should bubble up to say how this great idea would contribute to company's goals. And if they are contributing to some of the company goals, then map it there. It's actually still tied from the top going down. You're not saying great idea, but doesn't map to any of the goals and strategies, right? It still has to map to it. But if it's a great idea, but it's not mapped to any of the goals and strategy, then from a leadership perspective and through uh, the group that we have here is to say, I will forget some of the strategy. I will forget some of the goals. Maybe we should think about it. Maybe we should invest more of those. So that's how you tie to tie the smarts and visibility the information, both from the leadership and executive level view, and also from the team. And you tie them together by having an OKR framework and having a strategy and a tie the execution into it so that it's connected and similar to this model, right? So uh, instead of a connected, with a with some like us trying to do a good job and then we use a platform to connect that together hey becky this is tom from antidote Hi, can you hear me yes yeah so i like this a lot um question to you is um and, and antidote happens to be an okr company does reasonably well on a quarterly basis um but we manage that in a completely different system I mean, completely abstracted, uh, independent of product development. Right. And so clearly we want to uh, align the two and, and bridge the top down, bottom up, just like this says. So have you had experience with people actually corporate wide or company wide, uh, for example, possibly doing OKR management in Dragon Boat versus um, Dragon Boat being, that's just the product and engineering tool, right? Right, right. Uh, very good question. Thank you so much, Tom, for, um, for sharing that. So what we're trying to do are twofolds. 
One is the four companies already have a tool and used for even HRs and uh, some marketing company in bigger in size. They, uh, they, if they have existing tool, what we do is we pull those OKR information from that in product engineering because product engineering are very unique. Um, I will touch upon why it's unique and how it's, we think about that. The second part of that is that there are smaller companies, fairly small, that they will say, hey, instead of having four, five, six tools, I want to just measure and manage everything here. So we, so we have a smaller companies that actually just use Dragon Ball, manage OKRs. They also manage marketing initiative, HR initiative, and other initiatives also in our platform as well. So you basically run everything. And again, I think, you know, just like, um, so our main focus is the product engineering, product portfolio uh, planning to tie to outcomes. But for smaller companies, we can expand it into the areas that support that as well. Thanks for that. I'd be interested in eventually learning more. Thanks. All right, cool. Thank you. Good, great question. So I want to double click um, a little bit on OKR for product engineering and how and why it is different from, uh, from uh, sales marketing and typical other functions. And Quite often, OKR is designed such in a way that, um, let's see if I can find a slide for you. I think I have it somewhere. Ah, oh, there you go. So quite often for uh, OKR for, for product engineering is there are two things. One is there is a strategic alignment that's more important than, um, for example, sales marketing, because quite often a group do this and, and the most work can be breaking down into tasks and everyone go ahead and execute it. On the product engineering side, you have multiple groups, multiple scrum teams that all have to work together. There are different ways of coming about to drive, for example, uh, engagement that will be multiple initiative that happens and that doesn't happen quite often on the same quarter. Therefore, the OKR for product engineering to fit a traditional, like a purpose built OKR tool, it become a, a task measure. So the OKR for product engineering will be say, ship X, Y, Z, have bug X, count X, Y, Z lower, and things like that. It's more of activity driven, less about shipping product because the product has to get to the market that take usually more than a quarter to actually drive meaningful impact to see did they actually impact the metrics we want to drive. Therefore, that for product engineering, the OKR needs to be managed differently for the timing, the complexity, as well as the, uh, the allocation elements of it, which we'll talk a little bit as well. So I'm going to pause here for a second. I think it's an excellent question. A lot of people ask on um, why is OKR doesn't work with Agile. The reason OKR doesn't, quote unquote, doesn't work with Agile is that OKR is, is done something for, you know, if you push a marketing campaign, you can generate X, X Y, Z leads. If you, you do this, uh, you know, sales, um, you know, higher sell, X amount of sales and people, you can drive so much revenue. Some of the things are a lot more directly measurable and, and execution driven. So from that perspective, the OKR works really well. They can almost happen in the same quarter. Now, from a product engineering perspective, that become more challenging because the delay, because the, the strategic dependencies and, 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 and the, um, the complexity is different in terms of outcome itself, not activity. Tool itself. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the portfolio. Whenever I talk to people about portfolio, they will say, no, we only have one product. We don't have a portfolio. And that's really a very, I would say it's a, it's a very old school thinking, right? When the portfolio came around, most of the people think about a product like a physical product. So when you have a product portfolio, it's already a product line. You have, you know, the TVs and, 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 and the washing machines and things like that. Now, when you think about a software product, we actually expand that to a, a broader, more generic concept of portfolio, which is where you invest your resources. Right? We have a retirement portfolio. Our resource is the money. And then we'll say we're going to invest in a mutual fund, in a you know, stock, or we're going to in invest in bond, and we're going to invest in different asset classes that generate different return. The same concept of portfolio is really taken from there. What we're saying is even if you have only one product, software product, that you actually have a portfolio of different outcome you're trying to drive. The product has to be loved by your customers. It has to be good for your business. And also, it's something we want to build. 
And that's the best product. So you cannot just say, I built something my customer wants, but it's not good for my business. I don't want to use the example of Uber, but Uber is a great product. Most of us love it, right? But they're not, they're not making money. So now they're focusing on how to do some things to make money. So it's a sustainable, sustainable business. And that's something, this balance, we have to take how much we're going to invest in making customer happy and have them back drive value, but also in a way so that the business is sustainable so a customer can have it in the future. And also things about we can build it, right? So if using an example of Dragon Ball, we are in the business of building a portfolio tool for you to decide on a good product. We are not going to build the best you know, email client. We do have part of things that about sending email, et cetera, but we will not build it, just not our core competence. So when we look at our investment opportunity, we look at the product that we want to build, we actually think about them as a portfolio so that we will say how much we invest in things that will drive business, how much we invest in things that drive customer engagement, you know, um, um, referrals and, and, and customer delight, and how much we uh, invest in our platform versus a partner with others. So these are the different dimensions of our portfolio that OKR is also part of it, right? So we have OKRs that drive business. We have OKRs that drive customer engagement. We have OKRs about our portfolio platform and things of that nature. So with that portfolio in mind, it will help us to prioritize because how do you prioritize things for conversion versus things for engagement? It's not an apple to apple comparison, right? So these are the dimensions we need to consider. And then we use a portfolio allocation approach to assess. So then we can prioritize within a smaller bucket, apple to apple comparison. Um, so I'm going to pop, pause here for a second. Any question from anyone? All good? We will look at the real world example. So, um, you know, for, for some of you, for those of you familiar with the portfolio, um, general principle is that the, the cho actual choosing, which is the prioritization of individual uh, projects or features is important, but not nearly as important of where we allocate. So portfolio performance is the allocation plus the prioritization. Now, if we tie these together, we we'll say, where do we allocate it? We'll allocate it to different objectives. And then inside objectives, then we can know where we, how do we prioritize all the things within those objectives? So that will help us to decide within limited resources, what we are going to do and what we are not going to do. So I'm going back to here using this example. <clears throat> Can you guys see my new screen okay? Yep. Okay, so I am going to group this by, um, let me filter out. Okay, so now we can see is that these are, we now we group all our ideas by, by OKRs. And inside of that, we can see we don't have enough resources because they're red. And how do we decide on, let's using this example, a checkout. So how do we decide on where we are going to allocate our, um, let me go open this up. So obviously this is, uh, you can uh, define that. So now we are looking at different activities that compete for the same resources. And it became a prioritization decision, for example, with your leaders um, and your stakeholders on where we should um, allocate work. So, so we can see is that, you know, visually we can see this, these guys have, a, this improved conversion has a lot of activities going on, a lot of features, right? They seem to take their own, they compete against themselves on what resources they, they need. So now we can fairly easily to say, out of all these uh, initiatives or, or pro product features that we want to do to improve conversion, which one makes more sense and which one we can defer. 
So this will give us a way to prioritize within these, uh, these, these, um, this OKRs. So now if I want to see broader, how we allocate, I can also see where we are allocating our resources across different, across different uh, um, OKRs. So I, can, I guess this is a more of a second level, which is strategy. So you can see, hey, we're allocating 40% to streamline partner onboarding. Is it the most important thing? Is, it, is this the most important thing or it's, it's, it's a conversion that's more important? So now you can actually tie, you know, you say, well, put your money where your mouth was. So where your resources should tie to your, your objective and then your objective and, and then would we'll determine how you prioritize. So that's how we actually collectively tie uh, OKRs and the OKRs, Agile Roadmaps, and allocation coming into one uh, holistic view. So um, I'm going to pause here for a second and uh, in case anyone have any questions. No? All good? Becky, it's Tom. I have one quick one. Yeah. I like this a lot. So there's a trend here. I like things. Um, <laughs> How fundamentally does this rely on the underlying resource um, uh, modeling? Because it seems that bad data down below, doesn't matter how good your trade-off and your tagging system is. So speak to the dependencies to be able to get to this point. Right, good point. I think many of you already know. I'm going to just uh, go switch to a view that's more user-friendly because almost every one of you uh, has something like this, right? You will have some of your, uh, some of your uh, initiatives or products, and then you have some high level estimate. And, and this is something where um, we base this, uh, this on, right? And to your point, do, do we need some level of estimation? Yes, we do. Otherwise, we can't really uh, figure out is this a good investment or not. But does this one has, does this one have to be precise, and not necessarily? Just like if we would, if we would construct a portfolio, we will have some assumptions on the risk and the return, so that we can use it as sort of the model to build that. And that obviously, uh, you know, that would the assumptions would determine how good model is. The the nice thing of that is that we have a historic data because in Dragon Ball. Uh, unlike in spreadsheet, in spreadsheet, you know, almost all of us estimate somewhat, right? So you create a spreadsheet, you figure out do we have resources, do we don't have resources, and then you decide you move on. And then next month you or next quarter you have another one. But in Dragon Ball, it's not a case because we have a three level of uh, estimates. I will open this up to you. You can see what it says is here. Um, when everything started, we have a desired timeline. Right, and then you put an estimate, which is very high level teacher size or whatnot, right? And this is staffing, you may or may not need to do it, you don't have to do it. But in the end, we can tie story back to it. So what that means is you have a estimate and you will have a quote unquote actual. In the future, you can tie this and then to learn with our machine learning model as well to say, use this two weeks. But based on your data, uh, we find out every time you know, you know, person, John estimate two weeks, that always turn out to be four weeks. And this is the Lisa estimated four weeks, that always turn out to be two weeks. So you can use that can almost to gauge and to say how good they are. And then with the, with the data in one system, we actually allow you to have a better uh, uh, understanding in estimation. Thank you, thank you for that. Um placeholder it would be interesting if you could point to a previous webinar around the best way to do resourcing planning or something like that and that which is done in dragon boat versus that which is done in jira and just learning uh more there would probably help us i, I get that you don't need to be perfect you need to be these are directional and you can learn and and you have the historical data but I think um, our company would benefit from, a, from, from your experience and how to best uh, approach resource planning um, 
in the tools. So if it, maybe there's a, a, a previous webinar or something that would be helpful. Not a previous, but we'll be next. That works. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So yeah, at the end of the deck, oh, at, at the end of the session, I actually was going to ask anyone, is this helpful? Any other topics? We can definitely add uh, in that as well. Uh, I, I want to use that opportunity to kind of talk about a little bit of uh, so the resource planning and, and also how we put the, the roadmap together, right? The idea is that, which is almost always true, is that when we have a roadmap, we have three category things. It's you know big rock, something really meaningful, move the needle, and it's bigger and also more complex. Then we have this pebbles, right? Rock, pebbles, then pebbles is something enhancement, uh, you know, customer pain points. That's a small thing. Sand is the things you can plan, just come in, you know, bugs, production issues, and blah. So we have to plan our roadmap. The reason we want to plan roadmap is that we don't want to fill up our jar, which is our capacity, with the sand. So the big things can fill in. And the, you fit in the big things first, and then the other things that will just make room and get into that. And this is something I don't want to call the PayPal method, but you know, just so happened we use the rock, pebble, sand at PayPal, and uh, you know, then started almost 20 years ago. And this is like being used quite often now. And, and there's actually a medium post um, by David Sachs, who uh, was PayPal's first COO. He is, uh, uh, he is also the founder of Yammer, who, which sold it to, obviously, uh, a Microsoft a super successful company. And he has a very good Medium post that I suggest, if you're interested, you look at it, called the Cadence, How to Operate a SaaS Startup. And I was joking with him. I said, like, this is the PayPal method, PayPal Cadence, right? So the quarterly planning, how do you tie to product roadmap, the rock, pepper, sand, uh, pepper, sand structure, and, and you know, check it out. And that the reason I say this one here is that the estimation is only for big box. And then we don't plan our roadmap 100% for because we're not gonna plan for sand. Sand is just gonna come in. So we plan our roadmap based on historical value. Again, you have a tool, you capture that here. Based on historical value, we would know that we have probably, you know, 60, 70, 80% of things we can plan for and remaining do not plan for because it will be filled up. Question? Quite, very quite. So that's the end of it. Uh, some additional resources. There's the responsive ppn.org. It's something I really want to, um, you know, work with uh, all our uh, passionate um, members as well as, you know, program managers, anywhere, product leaders, uh, engineering leaders on how do we complement agile execution to create this uh, responsive way of uh, tying objectives, responding to external market needs, and tying our initiatives and strategy responsive to our objectives, and tying our agile executions and resource allocations responsive to what we're trying to accomplish. So the responsive portfolio management is a perfect way to connect where we want to be, the big picture, the vision to the agile execution so that our leaders and our organizations can, you know, you know, as they said, the ones that uh, survive and thrive is not the ones the fastest, right? So it's the ones that are most adapt the most and responsive to the changes. That's, that's um, a, a, a place that you can find information. We have a white paper around responsive portfolio management for tech leaders. And, uh, you know, and we will post more content and would love to hear your thoughts as well. And David Sachs, uh, Sachs article, I think is a very relevant for companies. What he says was something from 50 people to 500 people. Again, even for a company has tens of thousands of people, we always operate in somewhat of that size, you know, even within the uh, verticals or companies inside a company. So I think it's a really good read. And then use the dragon boat to make your life easier. All right. Um, um, any questions, comments, anyone? Hi, Vicky, this is Alex. Um, I don't have any questions, but just thank you. That was really, um, that was super interesting and definitely learned a lot today. So um, yeah, thank you for that. And is this uh, recording gonna be made available? Sorry if I missed that at the beginning. 
Yeah, yeah. Hi, Alex. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, and thank you for the feedback. Yes, this recording will be made available and I uh, publish this before Monday. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Um, hey, Alex, again, I guess one idea will be, and I think we talked about this before, is, you know, when estimations are, are done in JIRA, um, how they're being reflected in Dragon Boat, um, especially some of our, most of our tickets are estimated like in points for us in Agile, and Dragon Boat is many weeks, so maybe it's part of the resource planning, uh, actually, now that I think about it, um, but yeah, maybe it's just a sub part of, of that resource planning webinar. Awesome. That's a very good question. Uh, we actually do have, uh, so this, thank you for, for raise this. We actually have multiple customers raise this on uh, having a more flexible estimation point based and or pulling things out of Jira. So we definitely have that on our roadmap or keep you posted. But we'll add this into our next discussion on uh, some of our thinking and then we can, you know, obviously have a very active discussion in our next session on, on how best to, to run this. Hey, Becky, Danesh here. Um, uh, I'm from Niam. Uh, just wanted to understand this whole resource planning thing. Uh, how exactly uh, does it work? So, for example, I had the same question similar to what Alex had, where we, there are certain teams in the organization that have kind of moved to the agile model where we're doing story pointing and some others we, which are not doing it uh, in story points, but actually doing it in terms of hours or other ways of measuring things. Now, within... Um, um, Dragon Boat, I saw that you could switch between them, but it switches for the entire Dragon Boat account. Uh, what if you actually wanted to have certain roadmaps follow a different uh, method of uh, accounting for work uh, as opposed to others, which could use a completely different way of accounting for how much, uh, how much is completed from a particular idea? Okay. I see your point. So basically, this is around the uh, how we account for progresses, right? So the progress tracking, whether we use the story points or time tracking. Excellent question. Uh, so we definitely uh, have something to have more flexibility on uh, for different teams as well. We can talk a little bit more offline on how that works for your team. And but this is more for um, reporting of what's being done. And that can be another topic uh, we discussed. I think uh, so. Yeah, thank you for um, thank you for raising. Yep, thanks. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, planning is very important. But I would like to hear some about a uh, monitoring, execution, etc. The monitor execution, uh, Saf. Are you saying that how much we plan versus the progress we've made to date so that you can see whether we're on track or not? For example, or for example, execution of the roadmap. Okay. So um, would um, definitely uh, monitoring roadmap execution is it's a, you know, it's a something we do day in and day out. Would have loved to hear a little bit more on what kind of, uh, details you would like to learn more, we can add this to one of the um, webinars as well. How to use Dragon Boat as a tool uh, to, to monitor, maybe to present or to those uh, three uh, levels that you mentioned earlier, uh, the results, how to, you know, okay. to reach the OKR to executive, to manager to do it on a monthly basis, Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, I think understanding execution itself, the progress of that, and also understanding the results that the execution is driven to, it's something that we tie the outcome together. It's a very good question. We can definitely add this as a part of the, the topic we will have in the next webinars. And uh, hey, Vicky, Alex, again, just to follow up on that, and maybe, obviously, I'm new to Dragon Boat, so maybe that's something I have yet to, uh, to fully uh, get, a, get a grasp on. But to, to the same idea of monitoring, and um, if there is a way to, like, and maybe there is, to look back and look forward, kind of take a snapshot, like, hey, this is beginning of Q3, for example. This is our resource allocation. Let's take a snapshot of that. And then at the end, let's take a look back. And it's like, oh, this is what we planned, but this is what happened. So maybe it's within the same idea. Um, and maybe that's something that's already available. Um, so 
It's a very good question. We don't currently have it manifested to the front end. We definitely have that information available in, in our system. So the idea is over time, we'll give you more intelligence and a look back and would love to have continued the conversation on how that matter to your business that so we can um, definitely incorporate that into our future roadmap as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Alex. Any, any other burning? Would love to also hear from you is uh, some of the format on uh, what we want to work on. And do you, are you interested in having guests come in, have either current customers or maybe some other people you feel interesting? And um, we are happy to invite additional guests coming here as well. So, you know, you know, think about it. If there's anything that come up, please do drop us a line so that we can make these more useful and, and, and for all of you. And that just good. that sounds good, uh, Becky's Tom from Antidote. Um, I think it's always helpful to hear um, a, a use case or case study on a company's applied use and the learnings, particularly less about the tool learnings, but how to successfully implement change on something like this in an organization. And if you have companies who have success stories, um, or for that matter, war stories of challenges. Um, being able to share that is always a good thing. So All I right. like that. All right, that's great. Thank you, Tom. Um, I think we can definitely uh, reach out to some of you and also for your, your as well, if there's anything that you think interesting to share with the community, would have loved to, uh, to hear from you. But I think that's a really good idea that you know, we can help each other on building a responsive organization. It, you know, actually part of the movement uh, Agile started 20 years ago, and ever since there wasn't really much of things talking about how do we work with the Agile teams and the still driving business as a result. And this is something that, you know, that we actually doing that. Uh, we have spreadsheets and meetings and the best practices, but we really didn't put it into the framework. So I want to work with all of you to make this a framework that uh, everyone else can follow.